All right, now we're ready to talk about oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the last stage of cellular, cellular respiration that started with the production of acetyl-CoA uh, from uh, pyruvate, and uh, if, we're, if we're starting from glucose. So we talked about the process of converting glucose to pyruvate through glycolysis, and then pyruvate uh, is converted to acetyl-CoA by pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, and then acetyl-CoA can also be made from amino acids and fatty acids through their separate uh, uh, catabolic processes. And then acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle and uh, eventually gets converted into carbon dioxide. Uh, so eventually all the carbon from glucose or from whatever uh, amino acids or fatty acids you started with get converted into carbon dioxide. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other uh, parts get converted to water. And then the electrons get transferred to these electron carrier molecules like FADH2 and NADH. And then the, those electron carriers uh, enter the electron transfer chain, which uh, eventually the energy from that gets used to make ATP. Um, and that process also requires uh, oxygen um, and so that's why we call it oxidative phosphorylation because you're you're using oxygen plus uh, energy from these electron carriers to phosphorylate ATP and then that phosphorylated ATP uh, is then available for other enzymes to use uh, as energy uh, so before we get too far into talking about this process let's uh, review some things about mitochondria because that's where all this stuff is happening. So if you've ever heard the old saying that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, uh, this is why. So mitochondria, as you know, are, are small organelles um, in uh, eukaryote cells. They uh, have two membranes, actually, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane uh, is uh, really just a protective layer. It has large holes in it that uh, allow uh, molecules all the way up to 5,000 Daltons to go in and out. Water can go in and out. Ions are free to go in and out. So effectively, the the space in between uh, or, or uh, underneath the outer membrane is the, the fluid there is basically the same as the cytosol. So uh, between the two layers, you have this intermembrane space. So because the outer membrane has these big giant holes that let pretty much everything go through, uh, you have this um, uh, fluid that's basically the same as the cytosol um, and compared to the innermost compartment of the organelle it has very low pH um, and then the inner membrane is uh, meanwhile it does not have these uh, large holes in it so it's much more like the the cell membrane in that it has it's mostly impermeable to ions and small molecules uh, that unless they can go through transporters. Um, also, it has uh, these fold or cristae, um, which probably are just there to increase the surface area. And we'll see that the, the surface area, the, the surface of the inner membrane is where most of this stuff is happening, um, including the, the proteins that make up the electron uh, transfer complexes and the enzymes that actually make ATP. Um, now they don't always look like this, so this is this picture over here is sort of a, a prototypical picture of a mitochondria that you might see in a textbook, but um, but they actually come in lots of different shapes and sizes depending on the cell type and the and the, the species they come from. Um, but then inside the inner membrane, you have this compartment called the matrix. So uh, the matrix. Uh, is different from the cytosol again because it's separated from the cytosol by the inner membrane. So it actually typically has a relatively high pH compared to the cytosol or the intermembrane space. Um, it also contains most of the enzymes that you need for the citric acid cycle. So it actually has the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which remember converts uh, pyruvate into acetyl CoA. And then most of the enzymes, all the enzymes actually of the citric acid cycle, uh, are inside the matrix. Um, also, uh, the enzymes necessary for breaking down fatty acids and amino acids can be found inside the matrix. So a lot of the, the processes we've been talking about uh, up until now occur in the, uh, in the, um, the matrix. Uh, and then the, it also contains its own DNA and its own ribosomes. So in a way, the mitochondrion is almost like its own 
uh, cell within the cell. Um, it, it, the, the, in fact, there's reason to think that mitochondria started off as symbiotic bacteria in some ancient ancestor of modern eukaryotes and eventually uh, became so dependent on the host cell and the host cell became so dependent on the mitochondria that uh, they're effectively inseparable and so now um, that's where mitochondria uh, com came from. Um, the, the inner membrane also, by the way, contains um, the, the transporters necessarily to move uh, things like ADP and ATP across the membrane. So the process of converting energy from uh, uh, acetyl-CoA or from these electron carriers into ATP is uh, involves what's called the chemiosmotic model. So the idea is these uh, electron carriers come in essentially as fuel, and those uh, are those pass through several uh, enzyme complexes that use the energy to uh, move protons across the membrane, and they move them from the 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 matrix compartment to the intermembrane space um, and that actually uh, of course affects the, the pH of both sides that's why the pH of the matrix is uh, higher than the pH of the intermembrane in, inner membrane space intermembrane space and uh, in fact sometimes we call the uh, the matrix side the or the in the matrix compartment the inside of this membrane and the inner membrane space the p side so n for negative because uh, those those missing protons uh, end up leave with a net negative charge on one side and p stands for positive because the uh, intermembrane space contains an excess of protons which in turn uh, create a net positive charge um, so that that flow of electrons is converted or used to create that gradient uh, and then the the last step of that transfer um, takes a molecule of oxygen um, and uses it as the electron acceptor and that produces water and that's where basically all the uh, the energy gets uh, gets put into that's where the electrons end up anyway um, and then finally you have this ATP uh, synthase complex which uses that, that proton gradient to essentially drive uh, a mechanism that allows uh, the phosphorylation of ADP, um, and that's how most of the ATP uh, in this process ends up getting made. And so um, the, these electron carriers are key to the, uh, the first part, the transfer of electrons within the, the electron transfer complex. And so there are a number of different molecules that are used to uh, used uh, as, as electron carriers. A couple we've already talked about, like uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or just NAD. So the the oxidized form we call NAD plus. Um, again, sometimes um, there's a there's a phosphate group here um, on this uh, two prime carbon, and so we just call it NADP plus. And then when that gets reduced, it gets converted to um, a, a hydrogen atom gets added, um, and it's called NADH. So that's the the reduced form of this molecule with uh, now those two extra electrons in there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, FAD stands for uh, flavin flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is uh, a molecule of flavin mononucleotide with an adenine group attached. And again, like with NAD, it can be reduced to F, in this case, FADH2 uh, is what the reduced form of this uh, group is called. And uh, each time, again, as the electrons are added to those molecules, some of the energy uh, from uh, whatever is getting uh, oxidized uh, is transferred as well. Um, and ubiquinone is another uh, common electron carrier within the electron transport chain. So several of the complexes we'll talk about use ubiquinone, sometimes it's called coenzyme Q um, or just Q. And so this appears the oxidized form of ubiquinone. So when it picks up an electron um, and a proton, it becomes a semiquinone radical, and then it can take up another electron to form ubiquinol, which is the fully reduced form um, of the molecule, or just QH2. Um, and then there are a number of different cytochromes. These are uh, more of these porf porf porphyrin uh, molecules, iron-carrying uh, molecules that can be complexed with um, proteins. Uh, 
called cytochromes. Um, and these, uh, again, can act as electron carriers. So obviously we've seen these before in the form of, of heme, heme within hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, but here they're just, uh, instead of binding to oxygen, they're binding to or being um, used to carry electrons from one uh, uh, electron carrier to another. And then some of the proteins within the electron transfer chain include these iron sulfur complexes. So you have iron kind of complexed to the sulfur atoms of cysteine residues. And uh, again, those can, can pick up and, and transfer electrons as well. So this is the whole electron transport chain uh, laid out. There are four complexes and they're just numbered. So um, this is complex one here in pink. This one, this little one is complex two. This one's complex three. And then finally you have complex four. So each one of these is a complex of multiple proteins. And they're all stuck in the membrane uh, of, the, of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And so um, they all have some combination of these electron carriers. Uh, complex one, as we'll see, for example, uh, takes in ADH and removes its electron. So it gets, it gets uh, oxidized back to NAD plus, and then those electrons get transferred to coenzyme Q. Uh, and uh, and so on, um, and each one or some of them anyway, um, while they're transferring electrons, they they take some of the energy from that process and use it to move protons from um, the matrix side to the intermembrane space. Uh, remember that's why we call the matrix side the N side and the intermembrane space the P side because you're you're creating an excess of protons on the intermembrane side um, and you're removing protons from the inside. So uh, complex one, uh, complex three, and complex four all create that gradient by moving protons across. And then the last complex, complex four, takes a molecule of oxygen um, and then takes the electron from uh, that got started as an NADH molecule um, or an FAD uh, molecule uh, and uses it to make water, and that's uh, why oxygen is necessary for this process. So we'll talk about that. Um, so first, uh, complex one, um, it's this kind of uh, uh, Florida-shaped protein, and uh, it's sometimes called ubiquinone oxidoreductase uh, because it starts with a molecule of NADH, um, which again, that came from either the citric acid cycle or from glycolysis. And uh, those uh, extra electrons get transferred to a, uh, a molecule of flavin mononucleotide, which is part of the complex. And then you have a series of these uh, iron sulfur centers. So there's various locations within the protein that have these iron sulfur centers. The electrons uh, kind of jump from uh, one to the other through a series of, of um, reduction reactions uh, until finally a molecule of coenzyme Q gets reduced to uh, ubiquinol or QH2. Um, but the important thing is that in that process, as the, the energy from those, re those reactions uh, is transferred, the, the protein itself goes through conformational changes that essentially cause it to act like a little pump. It just moves protons or pumps protons from the matrix side or the end side of the membrane to the P side. Um, and then, of course, two protons are also used up in, in uh, reducing coenzyme Q to QH2. So you're, that's another way that uh, protons get removed from the end side. Uh, complex two uh, is, uh, meanwhile, kind of, sep kind of unusual. It's a little bit uh, different from the other enzymes. And uh, for one thing, it does not move any protons across the membrane. Um, sometimes its it, other name is succinate dehydrogenase. Um, and uh, its main job is to convert or transfer electrons from a molecule of succinate to uh, a molecule of ubiquinone. And if this uh, enzyme looks familiar, it's because it is actually part of the citric acid cycle. So actually all of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle are inside the matrix side of, uh, are all on the matrix side of the, the membrane, inside the matrix, I should say. Um, this one happens to be actually embedded in the membrane of the matrix. And so when it converts succinate to fumarate, um, it produces a molecule of FADH2. And uh, uh, so that's a, a reduction. And then again, uh, like with complex one, that electron goes through several of these iron sulfur centers. 
um, before uh, it reacts with a molecule of coenzyme Q to again make QH2. Um, uh, but here the, the there were no protons taken out of the process because uh, we got two protons or two hydrogens from succinate um, that got used to make FADH2 and then the the two FAT, FA, those two hydrogens from FADH2 end up um, being attached to uh, coenzyme Q. So uh, its main job is just to make co uh, QH2 which is now going to be an electron carrier for subsequent steps. Um, complex 3 is uh, kind of complicated. It's called uh, cytochrome C oxidoreductase um, because what it's going to do is transfer electrons from a molecule of QH2 which can either come from uh, complex 2 or complex 1. So both of those produce QH2. But uh, complex 3 takes QH2 and um, uh, oxidizes it and transfers the electron to this protein called cytochrome C, which is not really part of the, the complex, um, but it kind of binds to it. And the, the cytochrome C then becomes the last, uh, the, another electron carrier. Um, it goes through this uh, process called the Q cycle, where essentially uh, it's kind of complicated, but basically the point is that um, through through several stages you end up with, you start with a molecule of QH2 um, that uh, uh, is used, or the electron from that is eventually used to oxidize, I mean to reduce a uh, molecule of cytochrome C, and then um, uh, two protons are used in that process, um, and so you end up with, or two to reproduce them, I should say, uh, and so you end up with uh, uh, the uh, oxidized form of coenzyme Q and then reduced cytochrome C. So that's where those electrons end up. Um, again, you're using those iron sulfur centers as electron carriers within the protein, um, and uh, the the uh, uh, oxidation of QH2 in stage one produces two protons, but those actually end up on the P side. Um, so you're actually losing some protons there. Um, and then two protons from the N side also get used uh, to, to produce another molecule of QH2 in that process. So the net change is uh, two protons from the N side um, and then you have you know, four protons on the P side. So you're still moving protons across. It's just in this case, it's not really a pump per se. Um, it's just that the, there's a net movement of protons due to these, these reactions. Uh, and then the last uh, complex is called complex four, sometimes uh, called cytochrome oxidase because it's going to uh, oxidize cytochrome C. Um, and so again, it's this big complex uh, because this has several heme groups um, and several of these iron sulfur groups as well. Um, and uh, what it does is it transfers electrons uh, ultimately from that cytochrome C. So cytochrome C came from uh, from complex three, and it uses that electron to um, to reduce uh, oxygen to water, um, and uh, so that's again where oxygen comes in. Um, it actually acts as a pump and moves two protons from the N side to the P side. It also uses two protons from the N side to make water. Um, and uh, so ultimately you lose four protons from the inside so it also is contributing to that gradient but uh, again uh, moving the electron to oxygen uh, is kind of the last part of the electron transfer chain this in fact is why you need oxygen because uh, in the absence of oxygen if oxygen concentration drops um, this whole process uh, essentially comes to a stop there's nowhere for these electrons from cytochrome C to go cytochrome C um, builds up and so uh, each other step in the interaction going backwards stops so uh, the, uh, the Q cycle ends because there's no way for um, cytochrome C for the oxidized form of cytochrome C to pick up uh, electrons um, and all the way back to the beginning so um, this is this is uh, uh, why oxygen is necessary um, this is why you have to constantly have an influx of oxygen because oxygen is constantly being used up um, your cells can't really store oxygen. Oxygen, unlike uh, water and unlike ions, um, can cross the membrane uh, very easily. So you can't really have um, cells that, that store large amounts of oxygen. We talked about how hemoglobin and myoglobin uh, especially can act as oxygen storage proteins, but um, you can't really, uh, even that gets used up within just a few minutes. So um, 
uh, the fact that oxygen can easily diffuse in and out of the cell um, means that you constantly have to have a, a, a new source of oxygen um, to keep your cells producing energy. Um, so, uh, and of course the other thing that happens in the absence of oxygen is eventually this proton gradient that we built up um, will go away. Um, and so this, again, just kind of zoom out to show uh, the four different complexes and what's, what's going on here. Um, so it's almost like actually two separate reactions. So complex one um, produces QH2 by uh, oxidizing NADH, and that gets used by complex three to, uh, to reduce cytochrome C, and then um, complex four uses, uses cytochrome C to reduce um, oxygen and uh, move protons across. Um, so this kind of shows you the net reaction there. So you start off with one molecule of NADH, um, uh, one oxygen atom, and and then 11 protons from the N side end up on the P side. That's what that little subscript N and subscript P mean there. Um, so you've you've uh, uh, got one molecule of NAD+, plus, one molecule of water, and you've moved uh, 10 protons to that P side. Meanwhile, complex two also produces QH2 um, uh, from the the oxidation of fumar of succinate to fumarate, but that produces FADH2. So one FADH2 um, again with an oxygen atom um, and six protons moving across uh, is the reaction from complex two to complex four. So um, in in each case, you're you're transferring electrons, but more importantly, you're transferring protons from the matrix side to the intermembrane side. Because the next step is ATP synthesis. So this is the whole uh, whole reaction uh, process, including the electron transfer train plus uh, ATP uh, synthase. Um, so you you these complexes again. This is kind of a simplification of all four of them. Uh, these complexes through these these uh, reduction reactions transfer electrons over. They use that energy to move protons from one side to the other, create this gradient of protons. So now there's a, a whole bunch more uh, uh, protons over here uh, on the, outs the intermembrane side than on the matrix side. So you have both a chemical potential, meaning that the concentration of pH um, uh, has a big gradient across this membrane, and you have a large electrical potential, which means the net electrical charge across the membrane um, is relatively large. So net uh, negative charge inside and uh, a net alkaline pH on the inside as well. Both of those are used by this complex called ATP synthase. So um, this is ATP synthase over here. And its job, as we will see, is to allow those protons to come back in. So they go from the intermembrane space back to the matrix side. And as they do so, uh, they, that this, this enzyme takes ADP and inorganic phosphate and creates ATP. And that's the main source of ATP um, uh, for the cell. So the ATP synthase complex, again, is a, is a set of, uh, of a whole bunch of proteins, um, all of which are attached to the matrix membrane. Uh, and there are basically two domains. There's the F1 domain, which is the, the soluble part, and it's actually found in the, the fluid of the matrix. This is the part that actually makes ATP. So it has the, the uh, ATP synthase uh, activity to it, so it takes ADP and phosphate. Um, and and does its thing, um, and then uh, and so this is kind of a, just a schematic diagram of what it looks like. Um, what the way that this enzyme works is, or the the F1 domain works, is that it has two uh, subunits, alpha, beta, and there's there's uh, three sets of those, so two three alphas, three betas. But the alpha beta, actually the beta subunit, contains the uh, ATP producing uh, domain, and uh, what happens is that it goes through two states. It has sort of a, a state in which um, ATP has a high binding affinity uh, and ATP has a low binding affinity. So, and the and it switches from one conformation to another as this whole complex rotates. So, so this complex, the whole thing, kind of rotates um, counterclockwise here. 
and as it does though, basically as it, uh, the enzyme sort of interacts with uh, the this sort of structural components of the protein, the, the gamma and B2 subunits, um, the alpha and beta subunits go through their different conformations. So um, this little green arrow, for example, kind of shows the position uh, of the gamma subunit relative to the, the alpha and beta subunits. And so uh, here, the gamma subunits kind of engage with the beta subunit um, in such a way that it uh, has a low affinity for ATP, but this beta subunit has a higher affinity for ATP, and this beta subunit has a higher affinity for ADP um, and then inorganic phosphate. So when this whole complex rotates, uh, this subunit will be uh, will, will, will rotate up here. Um, so in each case, uh, basically each subunit uh, uh, turns, and as it turns, they go through different conformations. So, um, so the first the the gamma subunit rotates from here to here, and that causes the the beta subunit to go into this conformation, where now it has a higher affinity for uh, for ADP, um, and uh, uh, and then this subunit now has a low affinity for ATP. So it had an ATP bound before, um, but then as soon as that subunit rotates, now it releases that ATP. Meanwhile, this subunit, which had an ADP abound, um, uh, produces ATP. And then that uh, subunit rotates again, and we're in this configuration where now that uh, subunit in red that used to have a uh, higher affinity for ATP has a lower affinity for ATP, and it releases it. And so that's basically the way in which this uh, complex produces ATP. Each time those beta subunits change conformation, they uh, either are bound to ATP or ADP, or they have kind of an empty binding site. Uh, and each each turn requires the movement of protons across the membrane. So uh, basically three protons have to move from uh, across the matrix membrane in order to move from one configuration to the next. Um, and then, and so it's the F0 domain that's embedded in the membrane that actually moves the protons across uh, and is responsible for the rotation of the whole thing. Um, so the F0 domain consists of um, these uh, these C11 uh, uh, subunits that have proton binding sites um, and those are able to rotate and they're also attached to this gamma subunit which is kind of the, the central axis of the the f1 complex as well and then you have the a domain which is kind of uh, stationary in the membrane along with this b2 domain which acts as just a big uh, actuator arm to sort of hold everything together so the only parts that rotate are uh, the everything but the a and the b2 domains over here um, everything else rotates in a circle and it's the movement of protons uh, from one side to the next that sort of drives that that process. So this is kind of a top-down view of, uh, I'm sorry, bottom-up view, I guess, of the F0 domain. And so you can see there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11, 12 proton binding uh, sites um, within this region. And uh, when, the, when there are protons available from the P side, so uh, again, the P side has a higher concentration of protons. So the, the A domain has these little half channels. So um, the, the idea is that um, the, the protons enter through the half channel on the P side, um, and, uh, and then the, the entrance of that proton uh, causes this arginine residue, which has a positive charge, to be displaced. So it kind of, it kind of swaps, uh, uh, rotates from here to here. And that process of moving the that arginine residue residue um, causes the the uh, the whole thing to move. So uh, meanwhile, there's a, another proton that's coming in from the other side that's already gone through this whole cycle, and it enters um, the 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 other half channel on the inside, and when it gets there, the that now uh, positively charged arginine residue that came in um, is present and it causes that proton to get kicked out. So it comes out through the half channel on um, 
uh, on the inside. Uh, meanwhile, the whole ring turns uh, because of that conformational change of that residue. And so that, that then makes that, um, that arginine uh, residue go back to its original uh, confirmation to the the P side half channel and the whole thing repeats and so that's that's what's driving the rotation of this whole mechanism protons entering from the inside going around in a circle so all these protons go around in a big circle Oops. and eventually come back to the uh, the half channel on the inside and then they leave and that movement of that whole ring uh, drives the rotation of of uh, this whole thing. So the whole rest of the, the complex, uh, including the, the alpha and beta domains and the gamma domain uh, subunits all rotate uh, in the same direction simply because of the movement of those protons. So uh, you can think of it kind of like like a water wheel. Um, so if you've ever seen any of those old timey uh, flour mills where they have a, a, a water wheel um, in a river and the river pushes the wheel and the wheel then is used to turn uh, a flour mill or, or some other mechanism. Um, this is the same idea. It's the movement of protons across the membrane is used to drive this, this uh, enzyme, this protein complex in a circle and that then uh, uh, that energy is used by the F1 domain to uh, make ATP from ADP. Um, now uh, and that that's the the culmination of all these reactions so glycolysis citric acid cycle all the reactions we've been talking about all the energy that was uh, not all of it but but much of the energy that was started off as uh, or in those glucose molecules or you know maybe it came from a, a lipid or a, a, a amino acid um, eventually is used for this process just to turn this crank so that so that this F1 complex can make ATP. And then that ATP is used by all the various enzymes in the, in the cell that uh, need ATP to function, need energy. Um, now, one more thing uh, to mention about the matrix membrane is that, um, you know, of course, the, the matrix compartment, um, if you're going to make ATP from ADP, um, you need ADP to be present in the matrix. And, of course, eventually the ATP needs to leave because, uh, obviously, there are enzymes inside the matrix that need ATP, but really the ATP needs to get out to the cytoplasm so that all the, the uh, enzymes in the cell that need it uh, can get it. Um, and so uh, there are actually transporters that uh, that also use this proton gradient to move those um, those things across. So this is uh, the adenine nucleotide translocase um, here. So um, this protein here is called adenine uh, nucleotide translocase, um, and it is a transporter protein. Um, so a transporter protein is any protein embedded in the membrane that sort of facilitates some other molecule getting uh, across the membrane in one direction or the other. Um, this particular transporter is called an antiporter because it actually moves or transports two different molecules uh, and in opposite directions. That's what that's why it's called an antiporter. So it actually brings in ADP. So ADP comes in um, and ATP comes out. Um, and so it is able to do this uh, in part because, of course, there should be um, a, an ATP gradient of sorts being built up. So as we make ATP, the concentration of ATP should be going up in the matrix and the concentration of ADP should be going down. So most, both of those molecules are moving kind of against their concentration gradient. But it also helps that there's a difference in charge. So um, ATP has a, has a charge of minus 4, ADP has a charge of minus 3. And uh, that means that, again, remember there's also a, a, an electrical gradient across this membrane. So the more negatively charged ATP um, will, be, uh, will prefer to, to go from the matrix to the intermembrane space, while, as the, while the slightly less negatively charged ADP will, uh, will be able to come in. Um, to the matrix. So again, the, that, that gradient um, that was established by the electron transfer chain is also used uh, for this purpose. Also phosphate, the inorganic phosphate is necessary for this process because of course that's what we're, that's, uh, what we're doing here. We're adding a phosphate to uh, ADP to make ATP. So that phosphate has to come from somewhere and it comes from the cytosol or from the intermembrane space.
and uh, it gets transported by um, this phosphate translocase. So this is phosphate translocase here, and its job is just to move uh, phosphate into the into the matrix. So it does that um, with the protons actually. So this is called a symporter because it's moving two things across the membrane uh, in the same direction. Um, phosphates, uh, just because they're they're bigger and bulkier, um, and because there's not necessarily a large concentration gradient of phosphate phosphate across the membrane, um, doesn't really uh, want to cross the membrane very easily. So this uh, enzyme or this protein uses that proton gradient to help move stuff uh, at the same time. So uh, again, we have this excess of protons uh, on the intermembrane side. So this this translocase, the symporter, moves uh, for every uh, 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 phosphate uh, ion that it moves across. It also moves across a proton. So that that just helps that phosphate that enzyme or that protein move phosphate through. Um, and so then that phosphate can be used to make uh, to make ATP. So it's just another way. So that, that proton gradient is not just used to make ATP. Um, it's used for other processes as well. All right. Um, so that is, uh, again, it for this chapter. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks again for listening.